coming in, but I think the, oh, we're recording yeah. now, so I think okay. we'll, we'll get underway. All right, it's fine with us. Okay, thank you very you much. Good Wait. afternoon, late afternoon okay, here early in Atlanta. Um, Thank you very much for coming this afternoon. This is a, a really important occasion. Uh, today is October the 3rd is German Unity or the National Day in Germany. And so we're especially happy to have this uh, special guest uh, speaker with us today from Germany to speak on uh, the significance of the German elections that happened last week. Um, as I was thinking about this occasion, uh, well, first of all, we're really lucky to have uh, Professor Butza with us, and in part, it's because it's a national holiday that he could actually get away from his university duties. Um, but as I was thinking about the significance of German Unity Day, uh, and especially in thinking of the relative youth of my students, um, you might want some perspective on that. Um, the German, this is the 27th. National German Day or Unity Day, which means that it's been 20, it was 27 years ago today that Germany officially celebrated its reunification. And it it's, was reunified because of the 28 year period from 1961 to 1989 that it was divided by the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain. So this is a particularly um, interesting time to be studying and observing European politics and society. And it's a real privilege to have um, this very prominent German political scientist with us here at Georgia Tech Lorraine and, and live stream to the campus in Atlanta. Uh, professor Tim Buta is a professor and chair uh, in the Bavarian School of Public Policy at the Technical University of Munich. And we share something in common, Georgia Tech and the Technical University of Munich. We both like to claim our, our comparison with MIT. So Georgia Tech likes to say that we're the MIT of the South. And Tim shared with me earlier that the Technical University of Munich is really the MIT of Germany. Uh, so we are very pleased that he is here. He is uh, a very accomplished political scientist. And even though he's in Germany now, he's spent most of his life, his professional training on the other side of the Atlantic, where he trained at Harvard and then uh, on to Columbia University for his PhD in political science. And he started his career in our region, in uh, North Carolina, at Duke University, where he earned tenure and was associate professor. And uh, he's only recently returned to Europe and the University of Munich uh, two years ago. So we're very pleased that he's with us today to share his thoughts on the importance uh, of this recent German election. He's going to talk for about 20 minutes and then open up the floor for discussion. So please join me in welcoming Professor Tim Buta to the GTL campus. Thank you. Thank, thanks for the very nice uh, introduction. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, one of the uh, joys of, of having come to Munich uh, in, in, uh, well over a year ago is um, that I actually have among my, my duties to teach a, a class a year um, to uh, natural science and engineering students to sort of help them make the connection to some extent uh, between uh, their main fields of study and the social sciences. Um, us being a relatively new um, and only the second social science unit at the Technical University uh, of, of Munich. Um, that gives me hopefully some experience in striking the right balance uh, between uh, not assuming too much by way of prior knowledge, but uh, also not dumbing things down unduly. Uh, but if you find that I'm uh, using jargon or uh, otherwise uh, uh, you, you want some clarifications, don't hesitate to, to interrupt me uh, as, as I go along. Um, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll make it not too basic either. But let me back up sort of a little bit before I talk about the implications of the German election uh, that took place uh, uh, two Sundays ago, um, to just give you sort of a little bit of context um, uh, so as to not to assume sort of too much uh, background knowledge. Um, so Germany is a political system that has um, a legislature consisting of, of two chambers, 
and in that sense, somewhat similar uh, to the United States. Um, what we sometimes refer to as the, the upper house, the Bundesrat, um, actually has representation by the federal states uh, of Germany. So Germany is a, is a federal political system. Um, although the, the level of, of, sort of independent political action at the level of the states is uh, less extensive uh, than uh, you find in the United States, um, there are certainly various areas uh, of uh, politics and, and policy uh, where uh, states do differ quite a bit. And in any case, uh, each of the 16 German states has a separately elected parliament and, and government. Um, and so those are somewhat like the sort of Senate of the 19th century, really. Uh, it's the governments of the individual states that select uh, the representatives of that upper uh, house of the parliament. The lower house, uh, the Bundestag, um, is elected once every four years, usually, uh, in a nationwide uh, election at the same time. Um, and it's uh, selected through a system of proportional representation, uh, which is to say that each party is supposed to get a share of the seats in the parliament proportional to the share of the vote it received, subject to a, a threshold of a minimum of 5%. Um, this was one of the sort of lessons taken out of the uh, Weimar Republic period between what was one and two, uh, when German, the German polity was extremely fragmented, uh, and particularly towards the end of, of the Weimar period, before it broke down uh, into uh, the periods of, of, of Nazi rule. Uh, the number of, of uh, parties in the parliament was, was very substantial, many of them holding only few seats, and it became increasingly difficult to put together a governing coalition um, because uh, with that proportional representation, you still basically need at least 50% of the seats um, to coming together, usually in some kind of coalition government of two or more parties, in order to actually form the government. That government being elected, actually, or selected uh, out of the lower house of parliament. So unlike in the United States, where the executive branch, headed, of course, by the president, uh, is directly, separately elected, um, in Germany, uh, people elect the parliament only. And out of the parliament, um, depending on whatever majorities there are actually in the parliament, the government gets uh, selected. The chancellor, which is the, the German uh, prime minister or head of government, uh, getting directly elected by the uh, by the parliament then itself. <clears throat> um, so uh, even though uh, that that five percent threshold uh, was historically designed to sort of keep the number of parties that actually make it into parliament and the number of parties that therefore sort of makes sense um, to enter into the electoral race uh, at a sort of modest uh, number. Uh, the number of parties that actually exist is, is quite substantial. Um, so in this last German federal election, uh, there were well over 20 parties uh, that tried to compete. Um, for many of them, it was uh, quite apparent that uh, they were going to have no chance of coming anywhere near close of anywhere near close to getting even 1% of the vote. Um, and, and so you know, it, it's not irrelevant, of course, who actually votes for them. It's, it's one reflection of a so-called protest vote, uh, when, when people sort of vote for a party that they have no expectation will actually end up uh, getting any seats in the parliament. Um, but most of those parties are, are quite marginal. Um, what happened in, in this election um, two Sundays ago um, is that it was actually six parties and the largest number ever since 1953, um, to cross that 5% threshold um, and actually uh, acquire seats in the parliament. Um, now, traditionally, uh, Germany has had two, sort of in, in the post-war uh, period, has had two major parties, uh, the Social Democratic Party, uh, so the center-left party, essentially, um, and the Christian Democratic Party, uh, with its Bavarian sort of offshoot um, the Christian Social Union uh, in, uh, on, on the sort of center right. Um, and much of German politics operated uh, traditionally quite strongly along that sort of left-right spectrum uh, that we traditionally are familiar from uh, many uh, particularly European countries as sort of shaping a large part of their politics. Um, the party that's been sort of most significant beyond those two major mass parties uh, for the longest time has been the, the Free Democrats, essentially economically liberal, 
uh, to some extent also sort of social uh, liberal uh, party, um, but not in the sense of American uh, liberal, which really means kind of progressive left, um, but in the sense of uh, political philosophy, uh, liberal that is committed um, to sort of liberty and freedom um, and, and a relatively small state um, and, and uh, a relatively sort of hands-off policy, both in the private realm and in the economic. Um, for uh, a good number of, of, of years uh, in the uh, early period of, of the uh, post-World War II uh, German Republic, um, essentially the government shifted back and forth, um, simplifying slightly, but um, shifted back and forth between being CDU-led and being um, Social Democrat-led, depending on whom the Free Democrats, the Liberals, actually went in coalition with. Then in the 1980s, in the, uh, in the process of the environmental movement uh, gaining force in Germany as in many other European countries, um, the environmentalists actually formed a political party, the Greens, um, which became a serious political force and, and crossed that 5% threshold at the state level, um, starting in the early 1980s in a number of states, uh, and then by the late 1980s uh, entered the federal parliament um, and has been represented in, in parliament pretty much ever since, um, become a political force, um, but uh, never uh, quite uh, made it to uh, hold uh, serious power. Um, at the federal level, at the state level, they've been, they've been very well represented. Um, that already complicated the picture quite a bit, having four parties uh, rather than uh, three in particular, uh, since the Greens actually sort of ideologically really cut across the traditional left-right spectrum, um, making it in principle quite feasible for them to, to readily go into a coalition uh, with anyone. And that becomes important, thinking about sort of the, the trajectory uh, going forward now. Um, but they have, in the, in the um, 35 or so years uh, that they've been a, a sort of regular parliamentary presence in, uh, at the state level and then also at the federal level in Germany, become a, a quite established sort of standard uh, political party. Um, what then happened in the aftermath of German unification um, is that uh, part of the Social Democrats um, that were sort of more committed to uh, politically left policies ended up splitting off from the mainstream, more centrist Social Democrats and joined forces um, with the former communists of East Germany uh, to form a new political party called the Left Party. Um, which has a particularly strong uh, base in, in East Germany um, that uh, was crucial to its ability to sort of establish itself and cross that 5% threshold initially, um, but by now has gained a substantial following also in, in large parts uh, of, uh, the, uh, of, of former West Germany. Um, they uh, support a, a much more sort of redistributional, traditional left-wing uh, set of political objectives um, and uh, have become members of state-level governments in uh, several of the states, particularly in, in East Germany, um, uh, but are, are generally at the federal level uh, still treated by the major parties with considerable suspicion, um, in part because uh, they have been outspoken opponents um, of uh, the Germany's so at least military Western integration. They also have been very critical uh, of European integration um, and some of their sort of core political priorities are generally considered to be uh, quite incompatible with the, with the mainstream political parties. But it has meant that already for a number of years now, uh, the Social Democrats um, have actually faced a political competitor on the left of the political spectrum, uh, meaning that basically their ability to make um, compromises in the political center were constrained by risking losing voters on the political left. Um, the, the big development of this uh, election has been uh, that a new, well, still relatively new uh, political party on the right, um, the alternative for Germany, Alternative für Deutschland in German, so AFD, um, has entered the federal parliament now, or is entering the federal parliament now, uh, with these uh, elections, um, having come from uh, about 4% in the 2013 federal election, uh, which meant that they didn't cross the 5% threshold, and even though they got 4% of the vote, uh, they were kept out of the federal parliament. Now they went from that um, to uh, more than 12.5%, 
uh, of the vote um, with a uh, wide distribution across the spectrum, much more heavily in Eastern Germany uh, than in, in the West, but even in, in most of the West, uh, crossing actually the 5% threshold with relative ease. Um, and therefore, there is now a, a political force on the right um, of the Christian Democrats um, that is sort of threatening them politically uh, from the right conservative end of the spectrum in a similar way to what the left party has been doing already for the last 20 years or so um, on, on the left. Um, the uh, representation of, of these parties is such that the, the Christian Democrats, the sort of center right, remains the largest force, but they've been reduced in the vote chair and therefore also in the seats of parliament. The Social Democrats, with whom they had formed a so-called grand coalition, as the two big parties actually have uh, formed the government uh, jointly over the last four years, um, and uh, good parts of, of several years before that, um, have uh, been reduced to just a, a, a little bit over 20%. Um, and so that means basically what the, the two mass parties of post-World War II Germany, um, which between them used to have a vote share of something like 80% uh, for, for much of the post-World War II periods, now are reduced to just a little bit over half of the total vote share. Um, and the remaining almost half uh, is close to evenly split between those other four parties. Um, so the, the Free Democrats, the Liberals, uh, the Greens, the Left, and that new right-wing party, the uh, AFD, uh, each hold somewhere between 8 and 12%. <clears throat> um, that uh, makes the formation of the, of, uh, the next government uh, relatively complicated, um, although it does also mean that there are actually two generally considered to be sort of politically viable possibilities. One is that the, the center-right and the center-left, Christian Democrats and Social Democrats, could in principle join forces again and form another grand coalition, uh, which would give them a, you know, a solid majority in the parliament, um, both of them having been uh, punished by the voters uh, for, out of various um, concerns of un dissatisfactions in this election. Uh, there's a considerable hesitation on, on both sides about actually doing that, and the Social Democrats have already uh, uh, declared uh, that they will not actually pursue uh, being part of the government again, uh, that they will uh, instead uh, go into the opposition and, and then actually be the largest opposition force uh, in the German parliament, um, which essentially puts the, the ball, at least for the moment, in the court of the Christian Democrats uh, to form a coalition with the two other relatively mainstream parties, um, that is the Liberals uh, and the Greens. Um, and um, this in, in, in German contemporary parlance then is, is sometimes referred to as uh, the Jamaica uh, coalition, uh, since the Christian Democrats traditionally have used black as their uh, representative color, the Greens obviously uh, green, and the Liberals have traditionally used yellow. Um, um, these three parties combined, but no, no, any two of them alone uh, would also have a, you know, a solid majority uh, in the parliament. Um, at the state level, in fact, in a couple of places, uh, these three parties have previously worked together. Um, and that, that's worked uh, you know, reasonably well. Um, but at the federal level, we've never yet actually seen uh, this combination. Um, and there are, on, on a number of issues, certainly uh, tensions of in, on, and incompatibilities, including uh, on the very divisive issue of immigration, which was a uh, rather important controversial issue in the German election and, and contributed substantially uh, to the strength that the uh, far right party uh, was able to gain. Um, so the most likely outcome uh, is at, at this point that we will actually see this coalition um, of the center-right Christian Democrats and the Bavarian uh, sister party, the CSU, um, combined with the Greens uh, and, and the Liberals. Um, it, um, uh, in, in principle, again, can, can constitute a quite stable coalition, uh, but uh, I would expect it to take several more weeks probably uh, for the negotiations between these three parties, uh, if they succeed, um, to uh, be concluded uh, before we'll actually know so what kind of compromises they're willing to make and, and at the end of the day, whether they're able to actually uh, come to a compromise uh, that they all can sort of sufficiently uh, live with. 
Um, the let me happy to sort of take questions on 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 what that means and and some particular policies. But let me uh, sort of then talk about a couple of broader issues uh, for for the the, the German political uh, spectrum, and then finally turn to uh, sort of implications uh, for for Europe. Um, in in many respects. Um, Germany has, especially economically, been doing actually phenomenally well uh, for a good number of years now. Um, and uh, you know, some uh, of the uh, willingness, maybe, of, of voters to actually give their vote to um, the smaller parties uh, might be sort of a, a certain uh, level of, sort of willingness to take risks. Uh, under circumstances when uh, you don't have all that much to worry about that is uh, terribly, uh, seriously disconcerting. Um, there's actually a very large share, 70, 80 percent of the German population that in opinion polls um, are generally fit quite satisfied uh, with how the country as a whole is doing, um, satisfied with how the economy is doing, um, even on the uh, certainly, if you think about you know, the recent American election, uh, so somewhat recent anyway, um, a very uh, prominent and controversial issue of sort of the distribution of, of benefits uh, or, or, or lack uh, thereof, uh, particularly of the sort of increasing economic integration um, here for, within Europe, but also globally. Um, the vast majority of Germans actually feel that the sort of level of equality um, and the way in which the system ensures uh, that the vast majority of, of people can partake in the gains of globalization, um, the vast majority actually uh, finds that to be quite uh, satisfactorily, uh, which makes it somewhat surprising uh, that we've seen uh, such substantial losses uh, for both of the uh, governing parties, uh, both the center-right and the, and the center-left. Um, at the same time, underneath that sort of diffuse level of, of satisfaction, there is also, a, a, you know, there are some very serious problems and, and issues um, that uh, not being forced to address because of a relatively high level of satisfaction, because the economy uh, has been doing quite well, etc. cetera, um, Germany has uh, maybe paid too little attention to. Um, and uh, while uh, even when 80% of the population are satisfied with how the economy is doing and how uh, evenly or, or reasonably easily, evenly uh, the gains have been distributed, that still leaves something like 20% uh, to actually feel maybe that, uh, that they have been uh, excluded. And we, we see actually in Germany, um, and we have seen in, in, in uh, opinion polls and, and, and other studies for um, at least a couple of years now, so growing numbers of people who, uh, I guess, in, in, in the United States would be the, sort of the core of Trump voters, um, at least one of the cores, um, namely people who feel that the system is really not taking uh, their concerns into account, um, people who feel that there's sort of extensive support services and social insurance and other ways uh, that the German state actually provides is, is not serving their interests. Uh, is and or is uh, completely ignoring them that they're sort of falling through the cracks of the system as it's been set up, um, and that feel alienated uh, from both society and from the political system. Um, now, people who are in that position can either become, of course, non-participants in the political spectrum, um, or uh, they can uh, become participants and then often constitute a sort of a core support base uh, for. Uh, more extremist uh, parties, and in fact, both uh, the far left, uh, but of course, much more strongly the far le uh, right, uh, has gained in these in these German elections. Um, it, I, I haven't yet actually seen any sort of conclusive studies of of uh, where quite all of this kind of came from. But it is interesting to note that German uh, electoral turnout, um, which traditionally compared to the U.S. has been very high. Um, in, in 1972, uh, reached 91 percent, um, has been on the decline uh, ever since the 1970s, uh, and particularly starting in the late 1980s and, and uh, then in the 1990s and, and onward, uh, went uh, quite low. Um, in uh, 2009, it reached a low point uh, with a turnout of 70.8 percent. Um, 
went up a tiny bit, 71.5% in, in 2013. Um, it went up from there almost five percentage points uh, now to um, 76 point something percent in, in 2017. So there was a, a several percent of the electorate uh, that haven't bothered to participate in previous elections uh, that actually turned out, and it seems like a, 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 a very significant share of those went uh, for parties uh, on, on the political uh, extremes. <clears throat> um, but there obviously is, is also, even at 76%, there's still a quarter of the population of, of the voting age eligible population that's actually not participating in the political process, at least as far as that political process might be defined uh, by uh, elections. Um, and, and so um, there is uh, you know, that some of those are, are, are probably not going to the election simply because they're quite satisfied and, and so why bother? Um, but uh, there's, there's good reasons to think that some significant share of, of that quarter of the population also is not uh, going to the polls because they feel like none of the choices that are actually on offer um, are really going to sort of address their interests and, and address their concerns. Um, and, and that's one of the issues that um, German politics that's become sort of a bit uh, self-satisfied, frankly, over, over recent years, um, I think uh, would have done well to address. Um, a, a, another uh, big issue uh, I mentioned previously um, has been uh, immigration. Um, Germany has, uh, under Chancellor Merkel, um, had a, a very open, welcoming policy towards immigrants, especially from uh, civil wars in, in the Middle East and elsewhere over the last couple of years. Um, and Merkel herself under, uh, underwent a, a, a quite sort of stunning personal transformation in her beliefs as to so what the right policy was in this regard. Um, uh, unfortunately, I guess, um, she didn't really take uh, her, her party quite with her entirely. Um, most members of her party were, were willing to sort of go along as, as long as she provided sort of clear and strong leadership. Um, but now that the election is, is not lost in the sense that they lost power, but certainly lost in terms of um, the, the level of support that they've experienced, there is considerable controversy um, over how to address that. Um, now, there's many aspects to that. It's, a, it's, it, it's of course, a, a quite um, complex uh, issue. But, but one of the things that I... Um, I think is, is uh, quite critical here, and that, frankly, all of the German political parties, maybe with the exception of the Greens, um, have failed to address for a long time, is that Germany, for, for various uh, often historical reasons, for a long time has tried to maintain the fiction um, that Germany is unlike the United States, which of course has a long history of, of the melting pot and, and is a country, has been a country of immigration uh, ever since uh, its founding, if you want, uh, or before. Um, Germany has maintained the fiction that Germany is a non-immigration country and that all these people who, uh, yeah, millions of them who live in Germany, who are not German nationals, um, are, are just there as guests. Uh, whether that's as guests of workers who, who were often actively recruited uh, by the tens and then hundreds of thousands in the 1960s and 70s, um, as well as uh, people who've come to Germany uh, fleeing uh, civil wars and, and, and other misfortunes elsewhere, um, they're always considered to be just so sort of temporarily uh, in the country. Um, and that has numerous consequences. One of them is that uh, most of them for uh, a long time, often several years, are uh, allowed to be in the country uh, as refugees or in some, some other status, but not actually allowed to work. Um, and so the government has to then provide for their, their cost of living, um, which creates uh, social discrepancies and, and, and ill will from uh, others who um, actually um, and are not you know, living uh, well either, but, but have to work quite hard for that. Um, on the other hand, uh, it, it uh, creates a situation where you, sort of the mindset and, and the political rhetoric is that these people are just here temporarily and of course they're going to go home, uh, whatever that home may be, even if that uh, may no longer exist and not have existed in, for years and decades. Um, it, it means that there's sort of no need in the same way uh, to integrate them. Um, to uh, ensure that they have incentives to actually uh, learn the language uh, and, and that you have a sort of cultural assimilation 
uh, which of course ultimately always involves so both sides adjusting to some extent. Um, so uh, Germany has avoided a, a lot of important issues there and, and a lot of policy changes that probably would be necessary, uh, not least since Germany itself has too, too low of a birth rate to really sort of sustain itself in the long run. So the country desperately needs immigrants actually in many respects. Um, but it has avoided really tackling these issues um, and it's not going to be any easier to tackle them now uh, that you have uh, on, on the one hand sort of uh, st much stronger redistributional demands from the political left uh, and uh, what's likely to become a sort of constant uh, uh, populist sniping uh, from the political right against any attempt to actually change these things and, and change the way in which Germany thinks about these issues. Now, all of this uh, is, of course, in, in the sort of very densely interwoven European sphere, in some respects, not just a German issue, but also uh, is, has a lot of spillover uh, into the European realm. Um, now, on the sort of upside, uh, if, you, if you want, at least if you're, if you're sort of uh, interested in and, and, and view favorably um, European integration and, and cooperation and, and, and political compromise, um, all four of the parties that are potential contenders for forming the next German government um, have strong commitments to uh, European integration, um, to the sort of deep Western integration of, of, of Germany, uh, which um, uh, no, no serious sort of Eurosceptic factions uh, in even the Conservative Party uh, in, in Germany, for instance, unlike, say, in, in Great Britain. <clears throat> Um, and so uh, uh, no matter how exactly the next German government sh uh, shakes out, unless something uh, incredibly, incredibly goes, goes wrong and they're unable to form a coalition uh, without including uh, one of the, the parties on the, on the political extremes, um, then you, you're very likely to see a, a very committed Europeanist government uh, from, from Germany going forward, a government that almost certainly is going to be headed by Angela Merkel as uh, chancellor still uh, for at least the beginning of the next legislative period, whether she's going to go on to actually lead the German government for uh, the entire four years is, is to be seen. Um, but uh, it, it's likely that we're going to see sort of considerable continuity in this regard. And as you may know, um, especially, of course, spending at least some time, all of you now in, in France, uh, the uh, still relatively uh, new French president uh, has uh, started to, to form strong uh, bonds with the, uh, with Merkel as, as the German head of government. Um, and the, the, that Franco-German connection has been in many ways sort of very much at the core um, of uh, European sort of peaceful cooperation uh, throughout uh, the post-World War II period. Um, and I, I think we can reasonably expect uh, that cooperative uh, core to hold uh, and, and hopefully quite strongly uh, for the next uh, several years. Uh, that said, um, there uh, are of course many uh, tricky issues to deal with on the European political uh, sphere and, and one of the um, uh, dangers I guess that, that Franco-German uh, cooperation has sometimes I think underestimated uh, is that the rest of Europe sometimes sees these sort of Franco-German cooperation uh, and uh, initiatives to push the EU uh, forward on certain policy areas when they come out as Franco-German initiatives as a sort of domineering um, of you know, two of the largest countries uh, of Europe. Um, that concern may increase actually as the UK uh, exits uh, the EU and, and therefore you know, one of the other sort of major countries that often uh, provided something of a counterweight and, and was well networked with some of the countries that are most skeptical uh, of the Franco-German um, uh, cooperation um, is, is no longer going to be sort of part of the EU uh, course. Um, and so I think part of the challenges uh, here is, is not to have the sort of Franco-German duo um, go too far out on a limb ahead of everybody else uh, in, in Europe. Um, and I think actually um, that, that Merkel at least has, has, has learned this uh, over time. Uh, when she first started heading the German government, uh, uh, partly because she comes actually out of East Germany uh, and, and therefore wasn't really sort of attuned to uh, 
the, the dynamics of European integration um, in, in, in sort of her political upbringing, if you want. Um, I think actually uh, often sort of with pride took initiative and, and presented German proposals. Um, and that didn't really go very well. Um, and and in, you know, in, in some areas simply pursued policies that certainly made sense for Germany, but probably in, including in, in, in labor market reforms and, and several other uh, changes that uh, ended up being very good, very effective for German economic growth, uh, but increasingly led to sort of this joinder between uh, the German economy and, and the rest of Europe. Um, and having uh, pursued some of these policies at the European level or in coordination uh, with Germany's European partners uh, would have been uh, much more effective. Um, the um, former German uh, Chancellor Kohl, uh, who uh, pulled Merkel actually into the political sphere in the first place, um, uh, it, towards the end of, of his period certainly was, was actually much more effective of this, having learned that Sometimes the best way in which you achieve things in Europe um, is even if France and Germany come up with the ideas um, and, and put forth some proposals, you discuss them quietly uh, with some of the smaller member states and then you let maybe the Belgian government or the Dutch government or maybe even Luxembourg uh, make the proposal at the European level to make the policy change. Um, so that others can actually take credit for this and it's not seen as much as a sort of imposition uh, of the large member states and, and uh, many of the sort of key steps that were taken actually right around that time of European, uh, of, of German unification uh, that made German unification sort of palatable in a way to the rest of Europe um, actually happened along those lines. Um, that there was an understanding so between France and Germany uh, in, in, on many issues, what was uh, going to, to work and what was acceptable to both. Uh, but then they didn't sort of push ahead um, and, and try to take political credit uh, for proposals, but they let others within Europe actually shape some of the details and, and go forward with the proposals um, and build a much broader coalition. Um, and my sense is that Merkel has learned some of this. Um, I, I, I hope Macron has a, a well enough sense of that as well, um, since uh, he is a, a relative political newcomer, at least on the sort of European scene. We don't know as much, I think, about uh, his inclinations there, um, but he, he certainly seems to have a lot of sensitivity about some of these issues as well. Um, so I'm, I'm relatively optimistic uh, about um, sort of the ongoing European uh, cooperation. Um, but uh, on, on some of the specific issues, such as uh, whether there is going to be sort of an increasingly common European budget uh, with maybe a, a European finance minister, um, something that France and French governments have on several occasions over the past 20 some years actually proposed and which Macron has, has now sort of put forward again as a, as a proposal to sort of move the, the European economy forward jointly rather than uh, as more or less well-coordinated uh, national economies um, is uh, going to be uh, you know, those kinds of uh, policy compromises are, are much more difficult to pull off uh, with a coalition government in Germany uh, that's going to be politically and ideologically more diverse than before uh, and include a number of players that are kind of untested, um, all of which uh, are concerned that you know, the next election is at most four years away um, and uh, the, the Liberals and the Greens are entering uh, the government uh, uh, you know, for the first time in a while um, with substantial electoral gains. Uh, they're going to want to prove to their voters uh, that it was worthwhile to have actually voted for them, that they're going to get something by way of real policy changes, um, and that some of the things that they uh, campaign to be opposed uh, on are, are not going to be sort of all falling away again uh, in the compromises that are necessary to form a, form a coalition. And so since local politics is almost always closer to both the wallet and the heart, um, than uh, the politics that's further away. Um, the more difficult the German domestic political negotiations to form the government become, the less uh, freedom of maneuver essentially is, is this government uh, likely to still have 
uh, when it comes to addressing European politics, uh, and even more so surely uh, when it comes to addressing uh, international politics. Um, the, um, and there I'm, I'm much more skeptical, frankly, about the sort of ability of, of, of uh, Merkel to sort of deliver um, on, on some of the hopes that uh, not least uh, the, some parts of the American political spectrum uh, seem to have projected upon her um, in terms of sort of carrying the torch uh, for um, a, a sort of philosophically uh, liberal set of policies and, and a global uh, role and engagement. Um, for one, I'm not sure Germany can actually carry that uh, by itself, surely not, uh, only if so with its European partners, uh, but also Merkel is going to be constantly watching sort of over her right shoulder uh, now in ways that she previously didn't have to, um, and that's going to constrain her ability to make compromises and her government's ability to make compromises, um, not least in transatlantic affairs, uh, which already, of course, uh, weren't exactly uh, looking particularly rosy, uh, given the tension that clearly exists between the Trump administration um, and, and uh, Merkel's government, and to some extent, the Europeans generally. Let me stop there and uh, um, address any issues that sort of you, you, you want to talk about and, and hopefully also maybe engage you in, in some uh, conversation amongst yourselves and, and uh, with those who are uh, in Atlanta. Well, thank you, Professor Vita. This was a very uh, comprehensive, you packed a lot of um, really interesting information into that talk. I know that Atlanta may be on a slightly different schedule, so I want to maybe give them the opportunity to pose questions first. Sure. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So with uh, the getting as many seats as it did, do you think Merkel or whatever coalition comes to be is going to change a little bit their course on, um, well, immigration or refugee policy at least uh, for example the issues that seem to exist around the deporting mechanism is that going to be something they look at kind of getting worked on because that seems to be the closest thing that uh opti has to an actual point so, and the specific mechanism you were making reference to it well for example oh, the guy that drove the, the semi truck or the lkv into the berlin place should have been deported at least two months before he did it and he was from Tunisia. Um, I actually went to German University for my undergrad. So I went to Epps Universität in Wichschach am West. And I have two classmates that have worked in the um, BAM. And one of them is quit and discussed. He's Yasin Kamasi. He's from Tunisia. He speaks Arabic. And he's kind of sick of every time he reported an issue, nothing was ever done. Ever. He was there for nine months. Yeah. I, I, um, so if. If, if somebody is, it, it, somebody's case is reviewed and, and the decision is ultimately taken um, that uh, this person doesn't have a legitimate claim to being a, ref, a refugee, uh, yes. then uh, the person is supposed to be actually uh, sent back out of the country and, and, and very often that's not happened for a number of uh, uh, reasons. Um, this is probably one of the easiest things to change, relatively speaking, since Nobody actually uh, categorically takes a position that uh, no matter what the sort of legal determination of a refugee case, um, that they should be uh, allowed to stay in the country anyway, uh, even if it's, if it's considered to be uh, without merit. Um, so yes, I would expect there to be a change there, but frankly, uh, yeah, those are not insignificant numbers, um, but, they're, but they're not massive uh, numbers. Um, and, uh, and I think one, one of the interesting proposals actually coming out of the Liberal Party is um, to, to differentiate uh, more systematically between refugees um, and immigrants uh, and actually create a, a, a conscious uh, immigration category and um, maybe even a sort of third separate category of, of people who are recruited for skills. Um, Initially, with a with a temporary work visa, but but create a trajectory uh, for for them to allow them to actually become uh, immigrants. Um, and and so partly this is this may be a matter of sort of political rhetoric, where actually having two new parties join the government um, might really churn, change the terms of the political debate in, in, in fruitful ways, um, and and lead to to recognition that. 
uh, in fact, the, the numbers of those who are, strictly speaking, sort of uh, refugees of, of some sort or another, with or without merit, uh, is actually much smaller. And, and that we might need to think differently about those who are actually really in the country long term that, that uh, in, in most respects, frankly, Germany wants to be in the country, um, uh, but that Germans also need to, to change their, their, their attitude and approach um, to, to that issue. Um, yeah, that uh, I, I'm, it, it sounds like the Liberals and the Greens were, were both sort of push in that direction. Um, but uh, to what extent the, the Christian Democrats will, will feel ready to make compromises there, um, uh, given uh, the, the you know, far right party um, competition that they're facing, um, is is uh, yeah, at, at this point and some level anybody's guess. Uh, there's a lot of internal division within the Christian Democrats on these issues as well. Okay. Thank you, Tim. We've got another class coming in after us, so I'm afraid we're going to have to sign off. But uh, thank you very much. Hopefully we can do this again sometime. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, before you all... We have a lot of time. Um, so I, I, if it's all right, um, I will just um, maybe start with a question myself, unless I see others pressing. Um, I, I would like to um, ask you, uh, you, you were so um, thorough, really, in your remarks about the challenges that Merkel will face in building a coalition government with the Free Democrats and the, and the Greens. But if I'm hearing you correctly, you still think that the, her government, the coalition government, the Jamaican coalition, or whatever it's going to be, will still be fairly pro-EU, uh, a, a Europeanist government, you said. But maybe you could talk just a little bit about some of the tensions that exist in the, the positions of the Free Democrats and the Greens, the Greens being slightly more supportive in a general way to some of President Macron's initiatives and the Free Democrats quite opposed to some of his positions on the finance minister. You touched on that, but if you could talk about what you think Merkel's calculations will be in forming her government. Um, will she try to choose uh, uh, ministers who will be maybe more sympathetic so she can really form that strong uh, Franco-German leadership on uh, European issues? What do you think her calculation will be in informing that government on EU-related issues? Thank you. Sure. Um, well, I think one, one thing that's, that's sort of useful to try to understand uh, is that um, the, the liberals in Germany are, are, are actually intellectually sort of much more coherent than, than probably most political parties in, in Western democracies. So um, they uh, are and they have been for decades a, a sort of relatively uh, small governments, relatively low taxes uh, um, uh, party, uh, and in, in that sense um, have been uh, philosophically liberal, but they also carry this over in, into uh, the, the, so, the social realm um, where uh, they have been uh, liberal in, in the sense of uh, wanting to sort of keep the government uh, largely out of uh, regulating or at least over-regulating people's private affairs. Um, and, and maintaining high levels of freedom of speech. And um, so they've been sort of liberal across the, uh, in, in the philosophical sense, across the spectrum of, of, of policies. Um, this has meant, among other things, uh, that they uh, have been pushing uh, in their electoral campaign and they will be pushing surely in the negotiations uh, for forming the government um, for uh, lowering taxes, at least marginally. Um, and to uh, you know, if, uh, certainly cap uh, and, and, if possible, reduce uh, the um, contributions that that uh, German taxpayer make to pretty much anything, including uh, the EU budget. Uh, the idea of um, shifting a lot of budgetary responsibility uh, to the EU um, runs kind of inherently counter to that. Uh, and I think they're sort of highly suspicious that once you start um, locating uh, not just policy making, but also directly budgetary authority, increasingly at the European level, you're going to come sooner or later in a, in a situation that if Germany continues to do economically really well and 
not all of Europe equally so, uh, then Germany is going to pay an, a, an ever increasing share of that common budget um, in, in, with the consequences of, of possibly German taxpayers' contributions actually increasing um, rather than decreasing, which is what they want. Um, and um, now you know, Germany, for instance, still has a, um, a, so a tax surcharge um, on high income earners. Um, and, and that's not just sort of, you know, the, the, the top you know, 2% or something. It's, it's, a, it's a very substantial share uh, of the income earning uh, population, um, which is roughly equivalent to the budgetary surplus that Germany actually has found itself in for the past year or two. Um, and so the Free Democrats have been making a strong push for essentially getting rid of this uh, income tax sur uh, surcharge um, because, in, at least in the short run, in principle, um, the German federal government uh, and, and its budget can afford it. Um, but then you have no extra resources left over with which to sort of, if you want, uh, feed the European budget and, and, and sort of build up political authority there, which at least initially would almost certainly create some additional costs. Um, the, the Free Democrats also have often traditionally pushed for having the finance ministry uh, as one of their portfolios um, to the extent you actually shift that responsibility to the European level. Then sort of one of the most appealing uh, government portfolios for them uh, would be uh, neutered in a way. Um, and so they're, they're also, I think, unsympathetic out of that sort of more tactical uh, domestic politics calculation. Um, so you, you, you see there in particular sort of a strong opposition um, to uh, at least increasing at the European level responsibility for budgetary uh, issues. And they do, um, you know, not entirely without reason, I think, um, have some concerns about the sort of level of regulations uh, uh, that, that come out of the EU. Uh, I think the sort of public perception of, of the uh, EU as the sort of regulatory behemoth is, is often quite overdrawn uh, in, in, in many ways. Uh, including uh, in that sort of the sort of European bureaucracy that's supposed to be all overwhelming is actually uh, incredibly tiny. Um, the entire European uh, that is EU workforce in, in all the uh, bureaucratic and policy making agencies of the EU combined is about the size of a sort of medium sized city, uh, city government. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, there are certainly you know, uh, quite a number of, of EU level rules um, not all of which are necessarily entirely uh, sensible and, and, and or at least sort of clearly comprehensible as to why they make sense. And, and so um, the, the, the Free Democrats actually want to sort of push in the direction of, of uh, reducing regulatory burdens. Um, and, and so they're going to be sort of hesitant about uh, shifting uh, more ability to sort of create new um, rules and regulations to the European level uh, if there isn't some safeguard uh, that there might actually also be some thinning out uh, of, of that sort of regulatory uh, framework. <clears throat> um, that's uh, going to be, I think, the sort of, the sort of political preferences, uh, if you want. Um, as, a, as a German chancellor, your ability to um, uh, sort of act even either tactically or strategically uh, in, in who you select, as you put it, as, as uh, the, uh, the ministers is, is quite limited. Um, the, this is the way that sort of cabinet government in a, in a parliamentary system works is yes, uh, there is a prime minister or in Germany a chancellor or, or some uh, similarly positioned head of government. Um, but that person um, often is in a relatively fragile position in the sense that uh, if he or she loses the support um, of the majority within their own party uh, and or the majority of uh, the parties that in coalition form the government, they're gone. Uh, there needs to be no new uh, election. They, they can be you know, voted out of office from within their own party um, on, on, on the whim in, in, in principle. Um, and so um, forming the government actually is essentially sort of a negotiation between different factions of one's own party as well as with the other parties uh, that will be forming that coalition government um, to somehow sort of even out and, and balance uh, all the various uh, interests. Um, and and yeah, one way to really complicate that issue 
would be to insist on that other party being supposed to appoint this person but not that person. Um, so as the chancellor who, or the chancellor who, the person who hopes to become the chancellor, um, the, the, the last thing you usually do is try to interfere with the internal politics of one of your coalition partners. Um, so the, the, what the negotiations are going to be about is essentially which portfolios are going to be headed up by which party. Um, but then you, you essentially, it, it, it's customary, and I'm, I'm quite certain it's not going to change this time, um, to defer to that other party's uh, leaders and, and, and members, and, and in particular, of course, they're, they're, they're members of parliament, um, to determine who actually fills the ministerial seat for this and that portfolio uh, that the party has negotiated to get to fill. Now, these things don't happen in a vacuum, right? So when a party negotiates to have this ministerial post and that ministerial post, it's usually public knowledge who they're going to actually nominate to the, be the, the sort of secretary for this or minister for, for this or that. Um, but um, there's, uh, I think, relatively little uh, that Merkel is going to be able to do to really influence the individuals who, who take certain positions and it's kind of a, a given that there's certain uh, issue areas uh, that the liberals are almost certainly insist on having uh, control over and there are certain issue areas uh, that the Greens are going to have control over. Uh, that said, you never turn things over entirely to one party or another. Um, right? Every minister is joined by, by two state secretaries and in a coalition government, the customary thing is then the state secretaries come from the other parties. Um, so if you have a CDU minister, um, likely you're going to have a, a liberal and a green as the state secretaries for that portfolio. Yes. Um, I have two quick questions for you. Firstly, about the AFD and its strength in East Germany. Um, would you like to comment on that? Because I know this is also in Hungary. Is it strong? It's full of xenophobia. So what is it about these ex-Soviet bloc countries that they seem to have a strong hostility to immigrants in, in particular? What is the specificity of the ex-DDR? My second question is about the economy. There's a lot of talk about the German economic miracle. There's a lot of talk also about increasing corporatization in Germany, that more and more people are earning less and less money, finding it more and more difficult to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I wonder to what extent that has played a role. I mean, talk, talking about 500 euros a month to survive on, 700 euros a month, with many people shown on French television at the moment who are in this position. So this pauperization is also a feature of the modern German economy the last three or four years. That might be playing into these election results. Would you like to talk about that pauperization? Yeah. Um, so let me, let me start with the latter because it's much easier. Uh, not that it's easy, but it's, 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 it's easier. Um, in uh, that, um, yes, there is a, is a growing share uh, of, of the population. Uh, and that's uh, at least part of whom I meant by, by those who sort of feel marginalized or, or excluded uh, from the economic gains uh, that the country has, has made as a whole. Now, it is still a relatively small share of the population overall. And, and frankly, I was actually uh, surprised, uh, but you know, ultimately fairly convinced by seeing opinion polls from different agencies uh, at different times repeatedly uh, over the last several months showing with considerable consistency um, you know, 70, 80 percent and up of the population saying that they're actually quite satisfied uh, with the, the income distribution and, and um, government programs that ensure sort of post-tax uh, equalization. And, and you even get a, a very substantial share of people who are at the lower end of the income spectrum um, uh, saying that, um, and in, in including large, uh, at least large minorities of the people who, are, who voted for um, the opposition parties, including the extremes. Uh, you even have, even among the left party supporters, you actually see a 20-30% you know, who say they're actually quite satisfied uh, with, the, with the distributional uh, outcomes of, of, of Germany at, at this point. Um, nonetheless, it, it truly contributed um, and, and in the sort of more traditional uh, party spectrum that is dominated by the left-right dimension, um, there was sort of a, a clear electoral strategy for people who were concerned about um, the sort of increasing inequality. It was to support parties on the political left who were going to uh, pursue policies of, of greater redistribution and greater equality. Um, but 
you know, uh, Germany not quite as much maybe yet as, as some other countries, but clearly um, also as a good number of other European uh, countries seems to f uh, see a sort of dissolution to some extent of the traditional stable political party spectrum and and a um, at least sort of decreasing importance of the clearly drawn lines of a, of a left-right spectrum. And part of the uh, appeal of, of the uh, you know, far-right AFD uh, in, in very similar ways to populist parties in, in several other countries, including, uh, frankly, you know, Trump in, in, in the United States, is that sort of uh, ideologically kind of weird mix uh, of, of at least claims um, to uh, massively redistribute and, and, and serve the interests of the poor and, and the disenfranchised and, and, and disadvantaged <clears throat> with policies that uh, are proposals that uh, are, are very likely to be very detrimental, in fact, to exactly those groups. Um, and, <clears throat> uh, and, and, and policies that certainly don't, are not likely to, to help them. Um, and so you have this, this mix of, sort of quite leftist um, and, and uh, extremely rightist uh, political positions uh, that seems to have um, helped them attract voters uh, that traditionally wouldn't have uh, dreamed of, of voting for a party that was on the traditional left right spectrum and would have been seen sort of on the far right. Um, what is it about Eastern European countries uh, xenophobia which uh, you know, the, the, the most uh, puzzling aspect of it is that often it's a, it's exact uh, reverse correlation uh, with the level of, of uh, foreigners actually living uh, in in a in a given district. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So uh, East Germany still has by far a smaller share of the population who actually come uh, from from other countries. Now it also, of course, has had uh, almost none. Uh, right. During East German times, there actually were uh, numerous tens of thousands of, of uh, foreign workers in East Germany, but they were quite carefully cordoned off. There was never any attempt to either make their presence very public uh, or uh, to in any way integrate them uh, with the German population. Um, you know, they, they were mostly from, from other uh, communist bloc uh, countries. Uh, they were essentially guest workers, frankly, in, in the East German economy, uh, which by East bloc standards was actually doing uh, generally fairly well, uh, at least in a number of industries. Um, but uh, sort of the grappling with these questions and, and having that issue of, of um, uh, sort of a, not necessarily dissolving, but sort of complicating a sense of national identity um, through uh, political integration is is something that you know, is still relatively new in the political spectrum. Um, and uh, you mix that with um, changes that occur from a very low base uh, that give people a sense that things are changing and that that generates uncertainties. Um, that you know, when, when people sort of are afraid of, of changes and, and uh, just experiencing changes as such, uh, that often leads to a greater attraction uh, of the political extremes. Uh, you know, that's certainly something we've seen in other places and at other times uh, previously. Um, it, it also, I think, is the case that um, you know, just some of the political leaders of, of the uh, far right, which is a, a sort of a more puzzling phenomenon, if you want, um, happened to come uh, out of uh, some parts of East Germany. Um, so there's a sort of certain local appeal um, that they that they seem to be able to make. Um, and I, I think there's you know, the the electoral campaign that the AFD ran, frankly, was you know vicious in many respects, but brilliant. Um, I mean they. they um, not, not entirely coincidentally, they actually hired some other people that uh, were working on the Trump campaign uh, previously, uh, including some people who actually Trump considered too, too extreme um, to, to work for him. Uh, and particularly in the last few weeks before the election, uh, some of the sort of imagery uh, exploiting uh, any uh, incidents of, of violence in which uh, immigrants or, or foreigners were implicated uh, and, and 
uh, you know, uh, generating these images of, of uh, Merkel with uh, blood on her hands and, and uh, sort of a trail of, of violence uh, uh, with which uh, she had sort of overrun uh, the German population. Um, uh, it combined with the slogans that are, uh, you know, clearly sort of tugging at xenophobic, racist undertones, um, but are formulated in such a way that, uh, that they uh, don't immediately uh, generate sort of severe uh, negative reactions. Um, it was extremely well done. Um, and the, the traditional parties have, have not been uh, good in, in responding to that. Uh, in fact, when... Some of it, yeah, um, <clears throat> but uh, often with just enough ambiguity, uh, right? Uh, I mean, look, in the, in the same way that, that, that Trump did in the United States, um, so sort of making it sufficiently ambiguous that you can appeal to those who, who, to whom sort of uh, racist and, 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 and similar ideas seem appealing uh, without driving away those who, who find that unpalatable. Um, and and uh, that's obviously much easier to do when you actually are the government. Um, it, it, that that appearance of um, playing it to, to both uh, sides is is much harder to uh, maintain when you're in the government. They're not going to get into the government. I mean that's pretty much a given. Um, whether the very fact that they're in parliament is is sufficient is is an open question. But I found it striking that actually when when it became clear that the AfD was going to be a serious threat of getting into uh, the, the parliament. Um, the Christian Democrats in particular, who was most immediately threatened by uh, this appearance of a viable force uh, to their political right, um, basically continued to be focused on, on, on fighting the social Democrats in the electoral uh, rhetoric and, and in, the, uh, rhetorical, in, in, in the electoral competition. Um, when it, it, it frankly, it seemed to me you know, numerous months ago, and I thought you, 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 you're fighting the wrong, if, you're, if you want to make sure that you win this election, you, you're fighting at the wrong end of the political spectrum, and you need to convince people that they shouldn't be leaving to, to the right, and I'm afraid that's, uh, that's what's happened. And it's, it's certainly, um, it's not just East Germany, they certainly got a lot more votes uh, in East Germany. But there are only very few electoral districts in all of former West Germany uh, where the AFD did not get 5%. Um, so it's, it's certainly not a situation where, where Westerners can somehow say, hey, this is an East German problem. You had raised questions? Uh, I think you're at a technical university. And I can't let you escape without asking one technically related question. There's concern in the United States that technology, social media, uh, has contributed to the polarization or fragmentation of the, of the population. Is Germany concerned about that? Does that seem to be taking place here as well? Is the government thinking about taking these steps? Is there any uh, realization that this is real or not real in Germany? And there certainly was a sense that the, the threat was real. Um, and there were uh, great concerns. Um, uh, which uh, one of my colleagues in, at, the, at the term actually was quite directly uh, involved with because he sort of developed some algorithms for identifying social bots, um, that uh, there could be a, um, a, a sort of uh, substantial manipulation of the social media space, um, particularly by uh, maybe political players on, on the political right. Um, by all indications, there was uh, some of that, um, but nowhere near to the same extent uh, as in, in the US, uh, partly, frankly, because uh, Germans are not as much on Facebook and, and their online presence is still more limited. Um, there uh, is also, I think, a somewhat sort of stronger sense of, uh, to the extent that they are on Facebook, they want to be in Facebook because they want to share pictures of parties and, and, and friends and, and other events, and it's considered sort of not appropriate to talk politics there. Now, you, you can talk politics in many ways, uh, and that's not necessarily apparent, but um, it, it's been argued, and, and, and I find it reasonably convincing that actually uh, this is sort of an expectation of, of, of where the political sphere is and where it ends in, in Germany, that 
provided some safeguard against this. Um, there, is, there were practically no indications that there was some sort of massive um, uh, Russian um, um, bot uh, presence uh, as there had been in, in, in the US by, from what we know now. Um, uh, however, uh, there was certainly a considerable amount of micro-targeting um, and much more, by all indications, much more and much more effectively on the right uh, than uh, elsewhere in the, in, like, in, on the far right uh, than uh, elsewhere in the political spectrum. Um, and um, there was uh, quite perversely, if, if you think sort of in sort of longer term historical senses, um, actually a, a, a serious push from Russian sources more or less obviously connected to the government um, towards um, people who trace their roots to Russia, often with sort of German ancestry of, of generations and centuries, um, but there are you know, upwards of two million people who ha have some um, significant connection to Russia in, in their family history, uh, a good number of, of uh, whom actually still speak Russian, um, but who are German citizens and, and have voting rights. Um, and, and they were quite extensively targeted and called upon to vote in favor of the IFD, uh, which if you think about German-Russian history, you wouldn't necessarily think that um, they, uh, any Russian government would ever want to call upon Russians to get them to elect a, a, a party that at least has fractions within it uh, that have, you know, uh, quite clearly sort of Nazi sympathies. Um, but if you think about the sort of larger spectrum of, of what Putin seems to be pursuing in um, the uh, in, in the kinds of interventions that the, that by all indications uh, Russian uh, actors have engaged in in the United States, it's sort of de the delegitimization um, of that liberal democratic uh, system. Uh, which the IFD fundamentally calls into question. Uh, and so it actually serves uh, his or, or those kinds of ideological purposes uh, quite well. Um, and some of that took place uh, via social media. Um, some of it also took place in, in much more mundane, traditional ways of flyers and word of mouth, etc. Well, I think our time is, has, has run out. Um, I neglected to mention in my introduction that Professor Gupta's work has um, been recognized by some of the, uh, the American Political Science Association, the International Studies Association, some of the highest um, scholarly awards uh, given by those organizations. And I think after this uh, wonderful discussion, it's, uh, it's quite clear why he deserved uh, those awards. And I forgot to mention that. I'm sure you're going to want to look into some of his research. And we hope that this, I know Professor Stoneman and some students will be in Munich next week. Um, so we, we're excited about a, a continuing uh, you know, collaboration between our two institutions. And I thank you all for coming this afternoon. We had uh, twice the number of students in the room as did our home campus. So that makes me quite um, proud. So thank you all for coming. And please join me in uh, thanking our guest speaker, Professor Rupert. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here.